Chris Lamping here, PHRA's Executive Director. Welcome to PHRA's podcast, P4, People, Purpose, Passion, Pittsburgh. P4 is brought to you by our members and sponsors, Lattice and the University of Pittsburgh, Executive MBA Programs, and the Center for Executive Education. We appreciate their support, and we'll hear from them throughout the podcast, beginning with the University of Pittsburgh Executive MBA Programs and Center for Executive Education. Episode 10, Pete Tram, P4 host, and Chanel DeVito, Chief Human Capital Officer for the Department of Human Services, discuss the importance of understanding the makeup of your employees' work and how their work impacts the organization's overall success. All right, welcome to today's episode of uh, P4 with the PHRA, and Chanel DeVito is our guest today. Chanel, thanks so much for taking time uh, to talk with the whole community about your background, how you got to where you are today, and really share more about people in the workplace, diversity and inclusion, culture, and how we can all grow uh, through professional development in some ways that maybe we were taught before, but maybe some new innovative ways as well. You have a very interesting journey throughout the nonprofit space, and it looks like you've kind of been making your way north uh, along the East Coast throughout your career. Uh, So Chanel, without further ado, thanks for joining us today. And please tell us a little bit more about who you are and how you got to where you are today. Sure. So I'm actually not native of Pittsburgh. I'm actually a native New Yorker. Um, So I'm just as equally obnoxious about being very proud of being from New York. And I actually went to school in um, Raleigh, North Carolina. So that's why I went to look at my undergrad um, in business administration, um, concentration in HR. But the interesting thing about my program, it also focused on organizational change and behavior. And because I still wanted to stay on that pathway, I actually applied to Indiana University of Pennsylvania and was actually part of the industrial and labor relations program. And from there, I honestly, I felt like the world of HR like really truly opened up and really looked at different ways in which we approach our employees, but also how we look at them as contributing business partners. And for my HR career, I mean, all of it was started actually in Pittsburgh. I'm going close to 15 years now, which that kind of scares me now that I say the years out loud Um, (laughs) that I have worked in Pittsburgh. You know, I started off at UPMC, worked my way up. You know, I worked in corporate. I worked in physician services division. I started out as exactly as an HR assistant. So one of the best things I was always given advice on was, you know, you're going to have to work your way up. You're going to have to really understand what HR is from, you know, start from assistant and just work your way up. So I've been involved with recruitment, training and development, employer relations, and essentially all of that experience has led me to the position that I have now. So to your point, I do have a strong background in nonprofits from behavioral health, child services, to where now I am the assistant deputy director of human capital and HR operations. So say that 10 times fast, um, very long title. Um, and that's with Allegheny County's Department of Human Services. And so currently right now we have a 16 team members and we pretty much have everything you can think of with human resources from payroll, talent acquisition, employer relations and performance management. And we support close to 1400 um, employees that work throughout the county. So we started off in New York. You're a Steelers fan now, right? Let's just clarify. So I will root for the Steelers uh, because my husband was born and raised here and I probably would get looks if I didn't. Um, But if you play a New York team, I would secretly root for them, but we're going to lose. So you don't have to worry. (laughs) I I accept the fact we do not win. It's just um, generational fans that we have to stick with. It's part of becoming my family. (laughs) I can, I can appreciate that very much. 
So you talked about a couple of different terms used uh, for the HR degree whenever you were at school mm-hmm. in North Carolina and then up to IUP. Was it always called HR or was there kind of a transition of human resources used to be kind of called this and then these are some right. of the other words? How would you sort of define uh, those different titles over time? And then what is HR in, in your own words? Sure. I would say for me, you know, the titles have always been, it, so my undergrad is always just says human resources, but then, you know, you have those certain courses that really stand out to you. Like, in all honesty, the compensation course, I honestly, I got an A, but I probably fell asleep, Pete, but the one, because <laughs> it just didn't spark that interest. What always sparked my interest was the organizational change and development. How do we take concepts of train, of change management and how do we use that to really develop and really start to think strategically with human resources? Because I felt historically HR is always seen as, you know, it's the office you don't want to go to. You know, it's the hire, it's the fire, it's the paper pushers. Here, I have this document, please submit it and put it in my file. Mainly for even the job I have right now, this position is brand new. There was, there is no assistant deputy director, even throughout the state of Pennsylvania. So my position was the first. And as part of this role, with the vision and the mission of our director, Erin Dalton, she wanted to basically modernize the state of HR within DHS. So moving away from transactional, come see us, it was one of the three things, hire, fire, or where's my paycheck, but really, hey, HR, we're thinking about ways we want to train and develop our staff on equity and inclusion on basic managerial skills, emotional intelligence. So having HR become that strategic business partner, you know, it's a long way of saying having HR at the seat at the beginning of conversations and mainly having HR in the seat as we think about strategies that pertain to our workforce. I I love it. And it's cool to see how it's transcended over time. And it's important to have, you know, HR at the seat. It's important to have contracts at the seat. It's important to have all the necessary people at the seat at those right tables when it comes to business functions. And then that'll transition to some of the pieces of our conversation when it comes to the people overall and how we loop Mm -hmm. them in. So very, very cool. Excited to learn more, Chanel. Talk to me a little bit about uh, the biggest trend you're seeing in the HR space today. What's facing you and your 1,400 uh, people on your team and the overall HR landscape? Biggest trend. I would say the biggest trend, and I and also to understand that the culture at DHS, I would say it's much different coming from a public sector versus a, you know, a, a private sector for us is really utilizing HR innovations in regards to technology and systems. Historically, the department of DHS, it it was, you know, it was paper. Um, Everything was a paper document. You fill this out, you file. You look at this in your file. You're updating your personal information. Okay, update this piece of paper. Now we all know as HR professionals, we're never gonna remove ourselves from paper. But for example, let's start to look at HR innovations with HRSs really looking at how it's not only just the house employee data, but we can start to utilize training, performance management, um, even how we just have file management. So yes, we still have paper documents because we still need to have that, but I wanted to have both employees, both direct care employees down to managers have access to their own information. So uploading, you know, mandatory documents, like your clearance, your evaluations, that information is not secret. It's about the employee. So we want them to have access to that. So using these type of innovations and also looking at different systems, you know, I don't know if most would be familiar with this particular system. It's just a workflow system called KissFlow. We're now using that for the recruitment process. You know, as you know, you know, we're, you know, we're part of local government and secret local government can be a little slow. So with paperwork, you know, and just just by the nature of design, that's just government by design. So I think even from the state perspective, we're looking at what type of systems that we can create to really create a a view of transparency, but also just to know where you're at at any given time for both, not only HR, but also for different leaders. 
So we'll have to dig into that whole HR technology piece <laughs> after this one. I'm uh, still so, researching, so I have no yeah, problem. <laughs> there, there's, there's so many different tools out there, so many different solutions. And that's why, you know, PHRA is so phenomenal, right? Mm -hmm. How do we share those best practices and lessons learned? And, and it can be tough. So tell us, Chanel, whenever you're going through uh, these migrations and getting out of the, this is the way we've always done it kind mm -hmm. of concept, it, it changes the culture, right? And I'm guessing, right, just going to go out on the limb here and guess that not everybody's been in the office. All 1,400 people, they haven't all been in the office every single workday over the last three years, right? True, true? I would say true, correct. <laughs> okay. So this brings up, we have to prioritize a great culture as we're going through change, as uncertainty continues to plague us for better and for worse. So talk to us about some of the remote culture initiatives that you've done. What does this mean to you? And are there any tips or tricks you could share with all of us? Sure. And I will say, honestly, we're unique than most, I will say most organizations that I have come across. So we're actually, we have been back in the office since last August. So one of the things about DHS is that our main mission is that we support Allegheny County's most vulnerable populations. So it's some of our work that we do, we actually have to be in the office to accomplish that work. So for us, the challenge has been, even with not being as remote like other organizations, how can we still address the needs of our employees, especially think about a work-life balance? And so really me and my team, and just I will say also leaders throughout DHS also support the same initiatives on how we still in regards of how we know we are in the office, but that doesn't mean we do not have um, detailed, very thorough conversations with our teams in regards to innovation with just how we collaborate as a team, how we still address concerns with work-life balance, because we're hearing more of that language, I think more than ever come into DHS with our staff. And honestly, and this sounds it's sad, but with COVID, unfortunately, we had to start to think about that for our employees. I think also that also entails mental health. So we're the opposite of where we are in the office. That doesn't mean innovation and strategy stops. And it doesn't mean we still do not continue to gauge our employees, but we just have to pivot in a different direction to where we are assisting our employees with their concerns listening to their um, questions they may have in regards to the work-life balance. What can we do as leaders to supervise our teams to still encourage that behavior? Even though we're in the office, I think all the innovation that we were able to implement remotely, we're just now taking that back into the office and again, just really enhancing processes that we already had in place, but now in the office, if that makes sense. Yeah, so whenever you talk about culture, some of the notes I took down, uh, it's, it's that transparency, it's the accountability, yeah. the work-life balance, which is inclusive of mental health, listening is a key piece of this, and it's something that you have to do for your HR team, for the rest of the organization, and then walk the walk and talk the talk, practice what you preach to your clients, so if you're not eating, some people say you're, you're eating your own dog food, right? <laughs> so if you're not doing it this way, if it's not good enough and something that we'll adopt, how in the world can we get, uh, you know, other people to, to buy in and to do this? Is that, you know, that kind of sum it up appropriately? That basically, that, that essentially sums it up. Okay. So then as people are talking about, uh, you know, this work-life balance, I think we need to have some balance. We need to take care of ourselves mentally so that we can succeed professionally. Has this played into some of the professional development plans? And, you know, hey, career map is, you know, this. Uh, I want you to get to, uh, you know, this point in your career. How are you rolling in some of the, the balance? How are you rolling in some of this mental health to professional development? And what else? And that's what we're actually really starting to work on really this year. So one of the things we really wanted to do is to help supervisors, especially entry level. One of the things that, at least from my experience working in nonprofits, is that most of our supervisors were the direct care workers. So now they're the leaders when they were the ones actually doing the work. So we wanted to really start to work with our teams on how do you conduct supervisions? How do we start to embed the language that you provide to the vulnerable populations? With our, with our staff. So we're checking on the mental health 
and the balance of our communities that we serve, what makes our employees any different? So it's really having meaningful conversations be a part of the discussions about work. I feel that it's starting to help with, I say opening up the doors and stopping exactly what you said earlier, This, but that's how we never done it before, but let's do something different. And honestly, I think with the market, we have no choice but to look at things in a different way on how we communicate as leaders to our employees versus the other way around. So it brings a whole new meaning to the office you don't want to be in, hire, fire, paycheck, right? How does it exactly. go? Uh, beyond that. And diversity, equity, and inclusion is something that has become top of mind for folks in organizations of all sizes. I don't care if you're in the government, you're in a startup, you're in a Fortune 500 company. You know, DEI is something that we got to think of. So can you talk through what does that mean to you? And is there any initiatives that you've embarked upon? Anything else that you've seen and an action step that each of us can do to, you know, incorporate it or at least test the waters uh, in our own organizations? Inclusion equity is how do we go forth from actually making sure that's embedded into the fabric, into the culture, and into the systems of the organization? How do we keep those employees still engaged? and feeling as if they're welcome and they're invited, but mainly that they deserve a seat at the table and continue on with that path. Okay, and what action steps have, have you taken to get closer to that? You uh, talked about you know, increasing uh, this demographic in our workforce by such and such percentage. We don't wanna just check the box and say, hey, we're gonna bring people on. They still have to be qualified. Um, how are you empowering people to make those decisions? What are, you, what are you doing to actually make it possible, right? Let's, great idea, but Chanel, I, I can't do this thing, right? So how are you working through that? What are the, the baby steps, inch stones to achieve those milestones? Well, one of the first milestones, and I work very collaboratively with our Office of Equity and Engagement. One of the first things we wanted to do, actually, we just wanted to hear from our staff. There was no avenue to hear from our staff. So you have the leaders thinking what is needed, but we have not heard from the ground up. So we actually created a program just, and again, I think most HR departments have this, but again, DHS, where we're taking new concepts of HR that have not been implemented before and actually created ERGs for DHS one focusing on African-Americans. And so the main goal for at least for DH this was in regards to our African-American staff. So our statistics being reflective of the community members that we serve. But for us, again, we were not hearing from staff and we wanted staff to know that their voices are heard and we want them to be included in that. So just as simple as having the ERG and creating the policy and rolling it out. And I know most people go, but well, that's not revolutionary, but you have to understand not every company has implemented things of that nature. So that was our first goal was how do we hear from staff on an ongoing basis? So we take what they're seeing, listen to their advice, again, bring them at the table as a collaborative business partner to then help us start to create strategies upon that. And you take action and you, you listen action. and you, then you do stuff. How exactly. uh, frustrated do you get when you're like, okay, we're going to do a survey and we're going to listen and listen and listen and then listen and listen and, and listen. Like, well, okay, what's going to happen? Chanel, talk to me. What's, what's next, right? Going back to that piece that you said before of what's next. So if there's one tip for everything that's happening, remote, hybrid, virtual, in-person, uh, what would you kind of recommend to other people in this HR space, right? Knowing that it's a much larger space and more influential across all these different business partners. We're at the table. We're at the seat. Everybody else is here at this leadership business table. What can everybody else start to do to improve our overall culture, to improve our overall business? For me, and this is going to sound really simple, but I am a woman that speaks in simple terms. You have to listen to your employees. You have to understand the work that is involved. And I sometimes I've heard people say, well, I don't need to know exactly what they do. Actually, I, I think you should. And I don't mean the, you know, how do you process this paperwork, but you have to understand the makeup of their work and how that impacts them as an employee, be it good or bad. 
I feel that sometimes the voice of the employee is missing. And that may be because of my industrial labor relations background. So I'm always about what are the people saying? So again, it's like you have to listen to your employees. Yes, KPIs are excellent. I utilize them. I'm working our organization to focus more on data from a human capital standpoint. But also a big chunk of that is what I am hearing, what I have seen from our employees. And also, again, it goes back to the language of pure transparency and being able to handle that criticism and take that criticism and what you can start to do to implement success, but long lasting success. Again, you know, we have to stop the, the check the box work. You know, what do we do now? So future generations, that progress, that improvement, that process, et cetera, will always still be built into the organization, just continuing on improvement for processes and procedures, which overall will improve the culture. Building lasting and sustainable success for the future, right? What would happen if you stepped out of the business tomorrow? Would these initiatives continue to go on? And I think that's the, the biggest piece. We get so caught up in our day-to-day of, oh my gosh, I got to get stuff done. Am I able to think, what if I wasn't here? We can think about this as leaders, but we can also think about this as change management advocates. And like you said earlier, organizational training and development. How do we think about HR is indeed change management? It is so huge. So as we think about all these different pieces, Chanel, what's one piece of advice that you would give younger Chanel, hey, do this earlier in your career, and life's going to be a lot better. What do you wish that you knew when you were younger? I would say that I honestly would just do a better job of accepting my mistakes and not being my biggest critic. Um, Second, I will say, I I would say, little Chanel, you know, develop yourself as your own leader. I think as young leaders, you try to emulate others that you have seen in the workplace and, oh, I need to be exactly like that. But by being that way, you're removing yourself and you're removing your own introspection on what it means to be a leader. That also aligns with your personal convictions and your mission and your vision. So I will always say, if I can go back and just say, Chanel, You are a strong person, you know HR, you know exactly what you need to do, and just having more of that confidence, honestly, Pete, but also that develops over time as well. Heck yeah, I love it. All right, let's go into some of the fast fire uh, questions here where you just ask a question, whatever uh, comes to mind, say, okay, cool, got it. Uh, What book are you reading right now? I'm reading right now is called Reclaiming Our Space. It's by an author of the name of Feminista Jones. And essentially the book is a basically intra-level book in regards to Black feminism. And it does touches upon many things in regards to social media and also just social justice that is now taking place in our country, but also how does that impact us in the workforce? And again, I am someone that believes in continuous learning and development. So I felt for me being an African-American um, future leader that just learning the different ideas and techniques that I can now start to incorporate as me in my new position. So let me just uh, thank you for sharing that and then also correct you a little bit. You are not a future leader. You're a leader. I mean, right I now. am a leader. Yeah, would you have to say future yeah. leader? Oh my gosh. You know, the, yeah, the you're, elevator you're a only, leader today. The elevator <laughs> only goes up. So, so <laughs> hey, I'm next a woman one, of Chanel. the people. <laughs> ne- ne- next one, Chanel. So you sure. talked about... <clears throat> Uh, you know, mental health and work-life balance. I, I think you're a little bit of a biker, maybe a little bit of a yogi. What What are you doing for balance and mindfulness on, on your side? What are you doing? Um, you said yogi. I probably wouldn't call myself that just yet. I do like to do yoga. Again, That that is my way of just decompressing from the, the day-to-day work. Um, I'm better than I was last year. So I have made improvements. Um, but yeah, th- that is that has just been the main thing I really have just been focusing on is just doing yoga and just again, honestly, Pete, just taking that time just to really just decompress and just listen to silence. I think it does a world of wonders. And I'm guessing that you don't answer a whole lot of emails while you're doing your yoga practice. <laughs> um, believe it or not, I actually shut down my computer. Um, and my employees would probably say she's lying, but honestly, I do shut it down. So no emails when I'm doing my, my yoga. Good for you. Next restaurant that you're looking to go eat at in town or around town? Oh my gosh. Um, all of them? Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, um, oh my gosh, I, that, why, that should not be a hard question. 
Um, I actually, I am looking to, this is gonna sound funny, um, I'm looking to go to um, Molly's ice cream shop, which is down the street from me. And I was like, oh, Chanel ice cream is not new, but I have heard that their ice cream is phenomenal and I need to go check it out. And I'm in walking distance. So that's sad, Pete, that I have not been there yet. So I will be trying that next. All right. Sounds good. You burned some of the calories going there, coming back. Yeah. So you don't even have any of the guilt uh, with no. it. Phenomenal. No, not at all. Cool. Chanel, thanks so much for joining us today uh, for this session. A couple of the notes that I took here, um, you know, the, the message of, you know, starting in your career uh, after school, North Carolina, and then up at IUP, you have to work your way up. We can all learn from that uh, adage and understanding that we have to change the mindset from this is the way we've done it. And HR is the office that you don't want to be in. It's only higher fire paychecks to also open up the aperture to include the EQ, right? Our honing in on emotional intelligence, mental health, professional development. We are change agents for good when it comes to this people space, right? Beyond just HR. And when it comes to culture, it's a big focus on transparency, accountability, work-life balance, and mental health again, and listening, right? And it's something that we have to do for ourselves, for our team, for the rest of our organizations, and then our clients and partners. It was great to hear uh, some of the work that you're doing around the ERGs and diversity uh, and inclusion. And I'm excited to see more around these data-driven decisions. So Chanel, thanks again for joining us today. And um, you know, we look forward to growing with you and so your continued support to the PHRA family. Thank you so much, Pete. This was, this was a great opportunity, an awesome experience. In a world where businesses are coming to terms with the demands of employee choice, solutions to improve workplace culture are crucial. Businesses of all sizes are doing everything they can to attract and retain top talent during this unprecedented time. Connection to the team, a sense of belonging, and a feeling of purpose rank high in the needs of today's work-from-anywhere society. Sound familiar? At Lattice, we understand the importance team building and positive employee-employer relationships have on the success of a workplace. Done well, top-down and peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing can unlock new levels of productivity and profitability to create a culture of cohesive collaboration. Ongoing high-quality connections reduce burnout and mitigate mental health issues, more important now than ever with social isolation on the rise. Lattice is a tool to make internal employee engagement easier and much more impactful for the entire organization. Lattice is a proven, secure workplace solution that is easy to implement for organizations of all sizes. So what are you waiting for? Let's Lattice. The PHRA P4 podcast was created to help build HR readers through discussions with thought and business leaders on the most critical success factor of any business, its people. If you enjoy an episode, please help us spread the word by subscribing to the podcast and providing us a rating. We would love for you to take a screenshot of the episode, tag PHRA, and share it with your followers. Until next time, thank you for watching and thank you for listening.